A View of the Earth by Michael Massimino. In 1984, I was a senior in college and I went to see the movie The Right Stuff. And a couple of things really struck me in that movie. The first was the view out the window of John Glenn's spaceship, the view of the Earth, how beautiful it was on the big screen. I wanted to see that view. And secondly, the camaraderie between the original seven astronauts depicted in that movie, how they were good friends, how they stuck up for each other, how they would never let each other down. I wanted to be part of an organization like that. And it rekindled a boyhood dream that had gone dormant over the years. That dream was to grow up to be an astronaut, and I just could not ignore this dream. I had to pursue it. So I decided I wanted to go to graduate school, and I was lucky enough to get accepted to MIT. While I was at MIT, I started applying to NASA to become an astronaut. I filled out my application, and I received a letter that said they weren't quite interested. So I waited a couple years, and I sent in another application. They sent me back pretty much the same letter. So I applied a third time, and this time I got an interview, so they got to know who I was, and then they told me no. So I applied a fourth time, and on April 22nd, 1996, I knew the call was coming, good or bad. I picked up the phone, and it was Dave Leestma, the head of flight crew operations at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. He said, hey Mike, this is Dave Leestma. How you doing this morning? And I said, I really don't know, Dave. You're going to have to tell me. And he said, well, I think you're going to be pretty good after this phone call because we want to make you an astronaut. Thirteen years after that, it's May 17th, 2009, and I'm on Space Shuttle Atlantis, about to go out and do a spacewalk on the Hubble Space Telescope. And our task that day was to repair an instrument that had failed. This instrument was used by scientists to detect the atmospheres of far-off planets. Planets and other solar systems could be analyzed using this spectrograph to see if we might find a planet that was Earth-like or a planet that could support life. And just when they got good at doing this, the power supply on this instrument failed. It blew, so the instrument could no longer be used. And there was no way, really, to replace this unit or to repair the instrument, because when they launched this thing and they got it ready for space flight, they really buttoned it up. They didn't want anybody to screw with this thing. It was buttoned up with an access panel that blocked the power supply that had failed. This access panel had 117 small screws with washers, and just to play it safe, they put glue on the screw threads so they would never come apart. You know, it could withstand a space launch, and there was no way we could get in to fix this thing. But we really wanted the Hubble's capability back, so we started working. And for five years, we designed a spacewalk. We designed over 100 new space tools to be used, at great taxpayers' expense, millions of dollars. Thousands of people worked on this. And my buddy, Mike Good, who we call Bueno, he and I were gonna go out to do this spacewalk. I was gonna be the guy actually doing the repair. And inside was Drew Fustel, one of my best friends. He was gonna read me the checklist. And we had practiced for years and years for this. They built us our own practice instrument and gave us our own set of tools so we could practice in our office, in our free time, 
During lunch, after work, on the weekends, we became like one mind. He would say it, I would do it. We had our own language. And now was the day to go out and do this task. The thing I was most worried about when leaving the airlock that day was my path to get to the telescope because it was along the side of the space shuttle. And if you look over the edge of the shuttle, it's like looking over a cliff with 350 miles to go down to the planet, and there are no good handrails. When we're spacewalking, we like to grab onto things with our space gloves and be nice and steady. But I got to this one area along the side of the shuttle and there was nothing good to grab. I had to grab a wire or a hose or a knob or a screw, and I'm kind of a big goon. And when there's no gravity, you can get a lot of momentum built up, and I could go spinning off into space. I knew I had a safety tether that would probably hold, but I also had a heart that I wasn't so sure about. I knew they would get me back, I just wasn't sure what they would get back on the end of the tether when they reeled me in. So I was really concerned about this. I took my time, and I got through the treacherous path and out to the telescope. The first thing I had to do was to remove a handrail from the telescope that was blocking the access panel. There were two screws on the top, and they came off easily. And there was one screw on the bottom right, and that came out easily. The fourth screw is not moving. My tool is moving, but the screw is not. I look close, and it's stripped. And I realize that the handrail's not coming off, which means I can't get to the access panel with these 117 screws that I've been worrying about for five years, which means I can't get to the power supply that failed, which means we're not going to be able to fix this instrument today, which means all these smart scientists can't find life on other planets. And I'm to blame for this. And I could see what they would be saying in the science books of the future. This was going to be my legacy. My children and my grandchildren would read in their classrooms, we would know if there was life on other planets, but Gabby and Daniel's dad, my children would suffer from this. Gabby and Daniel's dad broke the Hubble Space Telescope and will never know. And through this nightmare that had just begun, I looked at my buddy Bueno next to me in his space suit, and he was there to assist in the repair, but could not take over my role. He had his own responsibilities, and I was the one trained to do the now broken part of the repair. It was my job to fix this thing. I turned and looked into the cabin where my five crewmates were, and I realized nobody in there had a space suit on. They couldn't come out here and help me. And then I actually looked at the Earth. I looked at our planet, and I thought, there are billions of people down there, but there's no way I'm going to get a house call on this one. No one can help me. I felt this deep loneliness, and it wasn't just a Saturday afternoon with a book alone. I felt detached from the earth. I felt that I was by myself, and everything that I knew and loved and that made me feel comfortable was far away. And then it started getting dark and cold. Because we travel 17,500 miles an hour, 90 minutes is one lap around the Earth. So it's 45 minutes of sunlight and 45 minutes of darkness. And when you enter the darkness, it's not just darkness. It's the darkest black I have ever experienced. It's the complete absence of light. It gets cold, and I could feel that coldness, and I could sense the darkness coming, and it just added to my loneliness. 
For the next hour or so, we tried all kinds of things. I was going up and down the space shuttle, trying to figure out where I needed to go to get the next tool to try to fix this problem, and nothing was working. And then they called up after about an hour and 15 minutes of this and said they wanted me to go to the front of the shuttle to a toolbox and get vice grips and tape. I thought to myself, we are running out of ideas. I didn't even know we had tape on board. I'm going to be the first astronaut to use tape in space during a spacewalk. But I followed directions. I got to the front of the space shuttle, and I opened up the toolbox, and there was the tape. At that point, I was very close to the front of the orbiter, right by the cabin window, and I knew that my best pal was in there trying to help me out. And I could not even stand to think of looking at him, because I felt so bad about the way this day was going with all the work he and I had put in. But through the corner of my eye, through my helmet, you know, just the side there, I can kind of see that he's trying to get my attention. And I look up at him and he's just cracking up, smiling and giving me the okay sign. And I'm like, is there another spacewalk going on out here? I really can't talk to him because if I say anything, the ground will hear, you know, Houston, the control center. So I'm kind of like playing charades with him. I'm like, what are you, nuts? And I didn't want to look before because I thought he was going to give me the finger because he's going to go down in the history books with me. But he's saying, no, we're okay. You just hang in there a little bit longer. We're going to make it through this. We're in this together. You're doing great. Just hang in there. And if there was ever a time in my life that I needed a friend, it was at that moment. And there was my buddy, just like I saw in that movie, the camaraderie of those guys sticking together. I didn't believe him at all. I figured that we were out of luck. But I thought, at least if I'm going down, I'm going down with my best pal. And as I turned to make my way back over the treacherous path one more time, Houston called up and told us what they had in mind. They wanted me to use that tape to tape the bottom of the handrail and then see if I could yank it off the telescope. They said it was going to take about 60 pounds of force for me to do that. And Drew answers the call and he goes, 60 pounds of force? He goes, Mass, I think you got that in you. What do you think? And I'm like, you bet, Drew. Let's go. Go get this thing. I get back to the telescope and I put my hand on that handrail and the ground calls again and they go, well, Drew, you know, you guys are okay to do this, but right now we don't have any downlink from Mike's helmet camera. I've got these cameras mounted in my helmet so they can see everything I'm doing. It's kind of like your mom looking over your shoulder when you're doing your homework, you know? And they go, we don't have any downlink for another three minutes, but we know we're running late on time here. So if you have to, and I'm thinking, let's do it now while they can't watch. Because the reason I'm taping this thing is if any debris gets loose, they're going to get all worried. And it's going to be another hour and we'll never fix this thing. We've been through enough already. So I'm like, let's do it now while mom and dad aren't home. Let's have the party. So I say, Drew, I think we should do it now. And Drew's like, go. And bam, that thing comes right off. I pull out my power tool. And now I've got that access panel with those 117 little bitty screws with their washers and glue. And I'm ready to get each one of them. And I pull the trigger on my power tool and nothing happens. And I look and I see that the battery is dead. And I turn my head to look at Bueno, who's in his space suit, again looking at me like, what else can happen today? And I said, Drew, the battery's dead in this thing. I'm going to go back to the airlock and we're going to swap out the battery and I'm going to recharge my oxygen tank. Because I was getting low on oxygen, I needed to get a refill. 
and he said, go. And I was going back over that shuttle and I noticed two things. One was that the treacherous path that I was so scaredy cat sissy pants about going over, it wasn't scary anymore. That in the course of those couple hours of fighting this problem, I had gone up and down that thing about 20 times and my fear had gone away because there was no time to be a scaredy cat. It was time to get the job done. And what we were doing was more important than me being worried. And it was actually kind of fun going across that little jungle gym back and forth over the shuttle. The other thing I noticed was that I could feel the warmth of the sun. We were about to come into a day pass. And the light in space when you're in the sunlight is the brightest, whitest, purest light I have ever experienced. And it brings with it warmth. I could feel that coming, and I actually started feeling optimistic. Sure enough, the rest of the spacewalk went well. We got all those screws out, a new power supply in, buttoned it up. They tried it, turned it on from the ground. The power supply was working. The instrument had come back to life. And at the end of that spacewalk, after about eight hours... I'm inside the airlock, getting things ready for Bueno and me to come back inside. But my commander says, Hey, Mass, you know you've got about 15 minutes before Bueno's going to be ready to come in. Why don't you go outside of the airlock and enjoy the view? So I go outside and I take my tether, and I clip it on a handrail and I let go and I just look. And the earth from our altitude at Hubble we're 350 miles up. We can see the curvature. We can see the roundness of our home, our home planet. And it's the most magnificent thing I've ever seen. It's like looking into heaven. It's paradise. And I thought to myself, this is the view that I imagined in that movie theater all those years ago. And as I looked at the earth, I also noticed that I could turn my head and I could see the moon and the stars and the Milky Way galaxy. I could see our universe and I could turn back and I could see our beautiful planet. And that moment changed my relationship with the Earth. Because for me, the Earth had always been a kind of a safe haven, you know, where I could go to work or be in my home or take my kids to school, but I realized it really wasn't that. It really is its own spaceship, and I had always been a space traveler. All of us here today, even tonight, were on this spaceship Earth amongst all the chaos of the universe, whipping around the sun and around the Milky Way galaxy. A few days later, we get back, our families come to meet us at the airfield, and I'm driving home to my house with my wife, my kids in the back seat. And she starts telling me about what she was going through that Sunday that I was spacewalking, and how she could tell, listening, watching the NASA television channel, how sad I was. That she detected a sadness in my voice that she had never heard from me before, and it worried her. I wish I would have known that when I was up there, because this loneliness that I felt, really, Carol was thinking about me the whole time. And we turned the corner to come down our block, and I could see my neighbors were outside. They had decorated my house, and there were American flags everywhere. And my neighbor across the street was holding a pepperoni pizza and a six-pack of beer. Two things that, unfortunately, we still cannot get in space. And I got out of the car, and they were all hugging me. I was still in my blue flight suit, and they were saying how happy they were to have me back and how great everything turned out. I realized my friends, man, they were thinking about me the whole time. They were with me, too. The next day, we had our return ceremony. We made speeches. The engineers who had worked all these years with us, our trainers, the people that worked in the control center, 
They started telling me how they were running around like crazy while I was up there in my little nightmare all alone. How they got the solution from the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, and how the team that was working on that Sunday figured out what to do, and they checked it out and they radioed it up to us. I realized that at the time when I felt so lonely, when I felt detached from everyone else, literally like I was away from the planet, that really I never was alone, that my family and my friends and the people I worked with, the people that I loved and the people that cared about me, they were with me every step of the way. Michael Massimino was born in Franklin Square, New York on August 19, 1962. After attending Columbia University, where he earned a degree in industrial engineering, Massimino attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for graduate school, receiving a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering in 1992. During his time at MIT, he applied to NASA to be an astronaut four different times, until he was finally chosen as a candidate in 1996. Massimino has been on two space flights, logging a total of 571 hours and 47 minutes in space, including 30 hours and 4 minutes of spacewalking across four spacewalks. Both of his flights were launched to service the Hubble Space Telescope, including the final Hubble repair mission.